um, what Paul ran into, he writes about back to the book, uh, to the people of, of Ephesus, the church. What he discovered that, the, that there was seven doctrines that separate the Christian church from the rest of the religions of the world. Seven doctrines that separate Christianity from the rest of the religions of the world. And so he talks about them and he does it in a wonderful way in Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. Here's what he says about the Christian church and the seven key doctrines that separate the Christian church in the world from the religions of the world. He said there is one body, the doctrine of the one body, the doctrine of the one spirit, the doctrine of just as you were also called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is all over all, through all, and in all. He says these are seven doctrines, and so we're we're studying those. We have now studied the one body and the one spirit. Well, when we got into the doctrine of the one spirit, of course, the advent of the Holy Spirit in the greater plan of God is equal of importance being the third member of the Godhead, the coming of the Holy Spirit is equally as important in dispensationally church age to the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now, the coming of Christ has to precede it, but once he comes and finishes the work of the first advent, dies on the cross for our sins, is buried and raised from the dead the third day, when he goes back and is seated at the right hand of God the Father, Placed in, a, in a place of authority, the Holy Spirit is sent back. And the advent, the coming of the Holy Spirit is equally of importance to the dispensation of the church. Because in his absence, the Holy Spirit takes up that space, takes up the void and takes up the ministry. Because that is so important, I have set, settled down here uh, on uh, some characteristics of the ministry of the Holy Spirit as a result of his advent. The whole spiritual life is based on the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. So we were looking at nine essential type of characteristics apart from the baptism, which I'm holding off to talk about it as a separate lesson in itself. So here's what we have done so far. If you look at your study guide, everybody has a study guide. This is our third lesson on the doctrine of the one spirit. If you're behind it in this study, then you can pick it up on doctrinalstudies.com. And, and you would be wise to do it. For example, we have already studied under the doctrine of the one spirit. We have already studied the importance of the nine fruit of the Holy Spirit. Now, they operate in plurality, but individually operation. You have nine fruit, but it's, it's, it's singular, not plural, in discussion. Because the Holy Spirit takes each one of these, and each one of these are dynamically important to your life. For example, By any chance, do you know what the last one is? You should. If you haven't learned the rest of them, learn this one. Now, if you don't know what the last fruit of the Holy Spirit is, I'm going to ask you, if you don't know it, now look, it don't matter the rest of it, but you ought to look it up so you can see it. The ninth. I think Paul held that off to the last to make a final point. Did you see self-control?
And I talk about the discipline of self-control in this regard. I'm talking about the supernatural function of self-control. Not talking about the natural discipline in your life to be a person of, of disciplined self-control. You understand that? I'm not talking about that. This is supernatural. This is self-control that doesn't come from you. It comes from the Holy Spirit to you. Do you know what a victory that would be in your life? Do you know what a victory that would be in your life? Do you know the joy of being in a conflict situation and where you normally become defensive and either explode out or explode in? Walk away with self-guilt rather than put your finger on them and blaming them? Do you know what the joy could be to your life to be able to be in that conflictual place and be able at that moment knowing I don't want to go where I always go in a defense mode and either collapse inside or collapse outside and absolutely go to the ministry of the Holy Spirit who dwells in you and him provide supernaturally where you can see him do that and you go like holy cow or, or some other spiritual term. When I'm hungry, I call it holy catfish. But just to give you a heads up. Do you have any idea the joy that comes over your life to see a victory that you have never been able to really get successfully because you jump into your defense mode and then you get into all this craziness in your soul. Instead of doing that, you have the indwelling Holy Spirit that just waits on a call. Boom! There he is, out of the flesh and into the spirit, into the spirit and out comes self-control. You're able to walk away with real joy in your soul about what it means to win, to be victorious in Christ. Do you know that? Well, we studied that. Uh, I just give you a quick review. We studied that. We talked about an effective prayer life. An effective prayer life. Do you have the confidence to pray and get the bullseye every time? I mean, every time. Do you have the confidence? You should. First John 5, 14 and 15 tells you you should have the confidence. Well, we talked about that. That's that's one of those studies. If you're not confident, you ought to go look it up, talk about it, at least read it. Then we talked about the in in the permanence of the indwelling Holy Spirit. I love this passage. It, it it's a security passage for me. John 14, 16 says that once he comes into your life from the point of salvation, he can never leave it. Never leave it. I bet he's been tempted sometimes. Oh, I don't know. You know how it affects him when you commit sin? Listen, you know how it affects him when you commit sin and don't confess it? It affects him. But he can't leave. John 14, 16, he can't leave. But it does affect him. You know how it affects him? Ephesians 4.30. You know what it says? It grieves him. I'll tell you, grieve is a strong word, wouldn't you think? Grieve is a strong word. I mean, grief can, can be such a thing, it's hard to get your breath from it. Grief is one of those things, wake up in the middle of the night and just don't know what to do about it. It grieves him. When you commit sin and don't confess, 1 John 1 9, it grieves him. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, I think it's 5.18. I don't know that I wrote it down. 5.18 or 19, it's in that ballpark. 
You know what it says? It quenches him. Quenching is like putting out a fire. He came to your life on fire for God. On fire. You know what sin does? Quenches it. That power, that excitement, that enthusiasm, all of those things that come from God, God the Holy Spirit, excited about you walking in his power, walking by faith, and seeing the God, uh, the plan of God unfold in your life. Bring, listen, it makes him happy. I can tell you it makes him happy. There's joy. I mean, Luke 15 says there's joy in the divine counsel. There's joy in the divine counsel of God when a, when a person gets saved. Well, we've talked about that. We talked about the first three of nine characteristics of the Holy Spirit that we're excited to share with you today. And I want you to pay special attention to John 14, 15, and 16 in our lesson today. they all be on your paper. John 14, 15, and 16. For the fourth ministry of the Holy Spirit we're going to talk about comes from John 14, 26, and 27. The fifth one we're going to talk about comes from John 15, 26, and 27. And the sixth one we're going to talk about comes from John 16, 8 and 9. This is Jesus teaching about how the Holy Spirit is going to minister once Christ has completed his work and returned to heaven and he is, his advent has come. So here we are in John 14. I want you in, in this section 14, 15, and 16 of John, you pay attention to the word helper or comforter. It's the Greek word parakletos. Pay attention to that word. It is used in John 14, 16 and 26. It's used in John 15, 26. It's used in John 16, 7. It is his working title. It is the Holy Spirit's working title when he comes in the advent of the church end. He is the comforter, the helper, the paracletus. the one set by God to be present in your life to bring you comfort. That's why he's the comforter. The comforter. It, it is one of his dispensational titles. That's very important. Very important that you understand that and pay attention to that. The comforter. Now, in your Bibles, look at John 14. We're going to look at 26 and see one of the things that the comforter is going to do. John 14, 26, 27. This is Jesus teaching his disciples before he goes to the cross and then to heaven. Now, here, the helper or the comforter is a paracletus. The Holy Spirit, this, this, this is a dispensational title, comforter, whom the Father will send in my name, whom the Father will send in my name when I get back home. I got to get back home first. He will, watch this, he will teach you some things, right? Teach you some things. He wants to teach you all things. The only reason he teaches you some is you're not open to all. <laughs> he wants to teach you what? All things. So sometimes you just have to swallow your pride, spit it out, and listen to him. Because he wants to teach you all things. Not just some things that you want to hear, but all the things you must hear. He's going to teach you all the things you must hear. And you must understand, and you must bring to the faith principle of your life. That's 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, inhale, exhale of the word of God. 
I mean, he's not going to preach some of the things that just tantalize you. Listen, that's goofy preaching. That's why you pick churches that don't teach you everything you need to hear. You don't want to hear them. You don't want to hear from your wife. You don't want to hear from your husband. You don't want to hear from your kids. Your kids don't want to hear from you. So you find a church that you don't have to con- don't have conflict. How crazy is that? The Holy Spirit has been sent into your life to teach you all things. Teach you whether you like it or not. How about that? He teaches you all things, and here's why he teaches you all things. This is why you have to cycle all things. Inhale, understand, bring it, bring it to application of, of faith. Faith can't be applied until it's established. You can't apply something that's not established. Believing comes faith when you believe it. When the word of God comes to your life, when you understand it, you believe it, it becomes faith. It doesn't become faith until you believe it. Now faith. Now you walk by faith. You didn't walk by faith before. You, you waffle too much. You stagger like a drunk man. Or a woman. Or at least anybody else. He will teach you all things, and as a result of that, will bring to your remembrance. You know where that is? That's in your heart. You know what remembrance is? It's in your heart, not in your mind. If it's in your mind, you're like, I don't know. That. When he brings it from your heart, it comes from a memory center. It comes from a frame of reference. It comes from a spiritual IQ. It comes from a belief system. Now you got remembrance. You got remembrance of the things that God taught you that are more important than anything else in your life at one point that you need it. You don't have to go to rationalism. You don't have to go to empiricism because you've got faith. You have the confidence of whatever God has promised, Romans 4.21, he's able to perform. So you're able to work the faith cycle in your life. You can't work the faith cycle without the Holy Spirit placing all the information there. He teaches it to you and he recalls it. And recalling is an enormous thing because it shows you that it's part of your spiritual IQ. It is part of, part of your belief system. Part of your belief system. It's part of your belief. That's new man thinking. That's new man thinking. It is from that new man thinking that you can battle the old man ways of life for change in transformation. Romans 12, 2. Where you're no longer being conformed to the old ways and habits of your life, but rather transformed by the renewing of your heart in a belief system that combats this. There it is. Promise. And bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Verse 27. Look at this. You want peace? You need 26 to get to 27. He didn't put 27 to 26. He put 26 and 27. Jesus made this statement and followed up with this statement. Peace I give to you. Now, wait a minute. Do you know that one of the fruit of the ministry of the Holy Spirit is peace? Right? What peace he's talking about here because it comes from the Word of God. He's talking about a peace that comes from the Word of God, which you can volitionally engage in and find the joy of being faithful. You know, there's a wonderful joy in being faithful. When you used to go a different way and now you have the word in your right lobe, you have it in your heart. And be able to pull that out 
into an exercise in your life of walking by faith and not by sight, and when you do it, the joy that comes from not losing that war in your life that you used to lose, and now you're winning, is the most rewarding thing you can ever experience. Do you know that? How come you don't know that? How come these old fortresses haven't been done away with? How come those walls have not been broken down? Those old habits are gone. How come they're not gone? He takes the word of God, teaches it, helps you cycle it all the way into a belief system that changes the way you used to think. I think completely different. I've been renewed in the mind thinking system. And he talks about it in Ephesians 4, 22, 23, and 24. What good is all this doctrine if you're not going to use it? Does he want to recall it? What's, what's he mean by recall? It means get, let's get it out. Let's get it out. Let's get it out. You got in the bank. Pull it out of the bank and use it. You're never going to run out. You can never run out of it. If it's in memory, it's cyclic. Never gonna run out of it. Get it out of the bank and apply it to your life. Get it out of the bank. Use it. Use it. Use it. So in verse 27, he says, Peace I live you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Here we go. Look at your heart. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at your heart. He is. He's looking at your heart. I want you to look at your heart. Peace I live with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, nor let them be fearful or doubtful. If you have the word of God in your heart operating on the teach and recall system, the Holy Spirit has obligated himself to what? Recall. Not just teach. Recall. He will recall. And when he comes to recall, it's to put it in practice. You walk it out by faith and not by sight. And you watch the Holy Spirit and God bring it to pass. You'll find the joy of victory. Now you'll discover the importance of all things passing away and oh behold, all things becoming new. Now you understand the joy of that. You'll be excited to do it to find the stability that comes from when you apply the truth of the word of God when the Holy Spirit urges you, anoints you, gives you the unction, however you want to describe it. That's the anointing. You know that? Listen to this. Here's what you get. Let me talk about that piece a moment. Let's go over to Philippians a moment. Let's go to Philippians, the fourth chapter, and look at this thing. <laughs> Be anxious for nothing. That's what you get from anxiety. Nothing. <laughs> so you might as well just understand it to start with. You know what you get? Nothing. Be anxious for nothing because that's what it's worth. Nothing. Matthew, the fifth chapter, sixth chapter in there. So here we are. Be anxious for nothing in verse 6, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Boy, that's a mouthful. Let your request be known to God. Wait. What 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 preceded my request? <laughs> uh, hey, this will change your prayer life. What? What preceded? Oh God, oh God, oh God. Not that. Look, here's anxiety. It's got you all bo bo boiled up. 
be anxious for nothing, in everything by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, now make your request. Get your ducks in a row. You pray in the name of the Father, in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of Christ, you pray according to his will. Get your ducks in a row. Supplicate. You may have to pray more than one. How about it, Paul? But I do. You may have to do. I mean, one prayer might not do it, Paul. But it's more than one, baby. How about it, Job? You sat down in the second pew. How about it, Job? But it may take more than one. It may take more than a hundred. Listen, that's up to God when he answers. Your job is to lay it out properly. Ask anything according to his will. You know he hears you. If you know you hear you get your request. You may have to wait a bit. Wait a bit? I ain't waiting for nothing. Well, you're in trouble. Man invented the microwave. Not God. God had just had you set it out in the sun and let it cook. I'm not, don't get ready for microwaves. I'm not opposed to microwaves. Now watch this. And once you get that done, and once you get that done, the peace of God, woo, the peace of God that comes from the exercise of the word of God being taught and now recalled by the Holy Spirit into your prayer life. Now, the peace of God, like you're letting your request be naked, known to God, and the peace of God will come to you before you get the request. Wouldn't that be nice to be able to get it and not have to wait till you get it and go like, well, I'm at peace with God now. I got my Christmas gift. Listen, listen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension. Oh, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish. The peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. There's your victory. A heart at peace with God because I've made my request. It will come because I prayed according to his will. It will come on his terms and his timing. And I'm okay with that. I have peace in my heart. And my mind is not confused about my peace. You know why? Because I got Philippians 4, 6 and 7. And when my mind wants to get a little bit uptight because I'm in a waiting stage of faith rest, waiting before the application and the completion of my, my deal can be completed, I'm in a waiting pattern because God is moving furniture in my life or in the plan of God so that when it occurs, it occurs in perfect timing. He's not waiting just to make you miserable. Just clearing up everything, getting everything in order, moving the furniture so everything's just right. And during that time, I'm at peace with God. Because of Romans 4.21. I've got peace with God because I know what he's promised he will perform. And I'm content. Do you know that? Do you know that? See, this is 1 John 2, 20 and 27 when he talks about the anointing work of the Holy Spirit. Here's my fifth thing. The Holy Spirit testifies in Lateria you, you know what English word comes from that? Watch out now. You know what the English word is? Martyr. Can you see it in that? 
Yeah, take that U and turn it to a Y. Martyr. The English word is martyr. Listen, we've been so spoiled in the Christian Church of America, we're not martyred for anything. We think it's martyr when somebody doesn't like us because I shared Christ. My world almost had to fight again. Now, when, they, when you share Christ and they drag you off and put you in jail and put you under the jail. In one way. Listen to this, John 15. Let's go back to John. Don't lose your place in John. I'm going to be all, all the way back to 14, 15, 16. 15. Here's 15, 26, 27, just like before. When the helper, when the helper or comforter, Paracletus comes, when he comes, he's coming when I go home. When I go home, he comes. When I go home, he comes. It's called the Advent. Jesus comes, it's called an Advent. When the Holy Spirit comes, it's called an Advent. It's a big deal. When the helper, Paracletus, comforter comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth. That's his whole purpose in teaching your life to bring you to truth. Truth. The truth of the word of God. Who proceeds from the Father, watch this, he will bear witness. He will testify of me. Listen, when, when, you, when you're around people and all the Holy Spirit does is testify about them or about him, you're in the wrong place. Because the one thing he doesn't do is he don't break on you and he don't break on him. He breaks on Jesus Christ. we got so much goofiness going on in the church of Jesus Christ and they were the ministry of the Holy Spirit too. If you just read John 14, 15 to 16 and believe it, you'd be on the track. <laughs> he will bear witness of me and you will bear witness. When he bears witness to you of Jesus Christ, when he bears witness to you of Jesus Christ and he will. Then he wants you to bear witness to others of Jesus Christ. Now watch this. And you will bear witness also because you have been with me from the beginning. Speaking to the apostles. We're way beyond that. But listen, they would say, and you're the beginning from us. This is not just to the apostles. This is to everyone in Christ. Did you hear that? The Holy Spirit will bear witness. Look at John, uh, uh, Romans 8, chapter 15 through 17. Probably not on your paper. When the Holy Spirit comes into your life, he witnesses to your human spirit that you are a child of God, that God is your dad, right? And from that day forward, Hello, Roger. From that day forward, his whole purpose is to take your human spirit and witness Christ every day in your life. To witness the dynamics of the importance of Jesus Christ every day in your life until your life is done. Does he do that? Listen, I tell you, that's the concept that wrote this little hymn, Every Day with Jesus, is what? Sweeter than the day before. You know, listen, that's right out of this idea. Every day, listen. That has overwhelmed my soul. My personal relationship with Jesus Christ has grown over the years that I have been in relationship with him. My relationship with Jesus Christ has grown enormously. Is it not yours? Every day is a fresh new experience of the day where the Holy Spirit takes me and magnifies the person of Jesus or witnesses to me in my life 
of the dynamics of my relationship with Jesus Christ. I mean, there's not a day goes by, I don't think to myself, boy, what a lucky dog I am. <laughs> a lucky guy I am. What a lucky guy I am. Not just to be saved, but to know and have an encounter with Jesus Christ, a relationship that's growing sweeter every day. And to see how he's using my life in ways I could have never imagined, could have never possibly expected. And so appreciative of it. That's what he's talking about in my opinion. It's exactly what I think the writer is talking about. And you will bear witness also. I think that's what he's talking about. I mean, I can keep my mouth shut. I want to talk to everybody about it. You know how everybody has a new grandson or a grandchild, and they bring it out, and they show you, and they got picture after picture after picture. That's the way I bought Jesus Christ. I, mean, I, don't, I don't care. I can mean, I talk about football about five minutes. Now I want to talk about Jesus Christ for an hour and a half. Or maybe Alabama football when I get to heaven. I don't know. Or maybe, but I don't know. Let me tell you, my life is a whole lot more than that. About five minutes with Alabama football, I'm going to talk about Jesus. Something's going to be eternal. That's just my opinion. John 21, 24, and 25. John. I'm going to struggle with this one. Here. John 21. John 21. John 21. John 21. I like the way John writes. The disciple. This is the disciple who bears witness of these things. I wrote these things, and we know his witness is true. There are many other things. I love this verse. There are many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books which were written. I mean, is it too much to ask you to read from man? Revelation. I mean, what? The, listen, the, the concordance and everything takes up more space than the rest of it. That bothers me a little bit. <laughs> it's not that. It's not that right there. That's not war and peace. That, that's peace that makes war. I mean, that. For those of us who went to college, those who went to that high school, you go war and peace. I had to maybe hire somebody to carry the book. I mean, let me close. I want to go to John 16. Now I'm going to wrap this up. John 16. I, I got to get at least get these three down. John 16. Here he goes again. In verse 7, he says, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the comforter shall not come to you. If I go away, I will send it to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. Then he explains. He doesn't leave it up to our interpretation. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer behold me. Now concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world, Satan, has been judged. I have many more things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. I feel that way right today. Okay? That's, I guess, when you go like, well, we need to wrap it up. So, let me quickly explain a couple things. Listen to what he says. Regarding sin, now he convicted the world, he's going to convict the world of sin because they do not believe in me. What do they not believe about Christ? They might believe that Christ came. They might believe he's a great prophet. What do I, what must I, what must they believe about Christ is the issue? Just believing that Christ exists as a person will not save them. 1 Timothy 1.15 says that Christ came into the world for this purpose, 
to save sinners. And Paul said, I was cheap. You know why? Because he was religious. He was religious with the Jewish Bible, thinking that he had gone through all the catechisms of necessary of the Old Covenant, gone through theology school of the sat under one of the great Jewish theologians, uh, Gamal, and was lost. And he calls himself the chief of sinners because there's nothing worse than that, to be like Nicodemus or like Paul. You think you're going to go to heaven because you're religious and you're a good person and everything's okay. It's not okay. Christ came into the world to save sinners and every human being born into this world is a born to sinner. Romans the fifth chapter. And when one sinner gets saved through the gospel of Jesus Christ that he came into the world to die on a cross for your sins, he buried and raised from the dead. If you're a Jew, listen to me today. You're going to have to believe that to get saved. They're going to send your head, soul to hell with the devil. Because you reject the Messiah, the anointed one that has come to save your soul. He came to save sinners. We were all born sinners in Adam. Romans, the fifth chapter. You are made a sinner by birth, and you've got to be born again to be made righteous. Don't listen to a lie. Don't listen to a lie. Paul was a very religious theologian of his day and was lost. Bound for hell, people. Lost. Died in that state, he would have been forever separated from God in eternity. But God knocked him off a mule. One from one and I'll be one. You got saved. And I'll tell you, there's no other way. And you're not going to be, listen, Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 19 says, you were made a sinner and you will be made righteous. When you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, you will be made righteous. Romans, Romans, the third chapter, verse 10, there are not righteous. No, not one. Not a Paul, not Nicodemus, not the Pope, I don't care. Not one. Not one. You have to be born again to be righteous. And you don't, you don't make yourself righteous, you're given it. It's a gift from God's marvelous grace. You listen to somebody damn your soul and send it to hell when you're listening to the truth? Don't you do that. Don't you do that. You know what judgment is? Listen to this. The, listen, the Holy Spirit convicts the world. Where does the Holy Spirit live? Inside every born again believer. So where is this conviction of the world coming from? Where's the Holy Spirit living in the world? Not the capital. He lives inside your mortal body, and your bodies become the mobile church. Your bodies become the temple of God because the Holy Spirit dwells there. And the conviction of the Holy Spirit is coming from the life of a believer who is telling the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is not someplace. The Holy Spirit is right here. It's in the body of every church age believer. And he's given testimony to you to you give testimony to somebody else. And when you share the gospel, he convicts them. And he convicts them of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Listen, all you've got to do is give them the gospel. The Holy Spirit does the rest. He does the convicting. He does the saving. All right. Write these down. Now I'm quit. Write these down. 
2 Corinthians 4, chapter 3 and 4. Oh, that's a powerful idea. It says Satan. Satan blind. Listen, his job is to blind the mind of those who are struggling whether they're believing or not. He's trying to shut that whole problem. Here's the Holy Spirit through your life convicting people of the gospel. Here's his job trying to shut that whole operation down. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4 in the angelic conflict, he's trying to shut down the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. You need to read that. That's a powerful idea. He's counterattacked that whole system. Just like he did with Eve in the garden. Counterattacked it. Let me tell you, greater, great, greater is he who is in you than is in the world. 1 John 4 4. Along with 2 Corinthians 4, chapter 3 and 4, add 6 6. And then add these three. They come from John 12, 31, John 14, 30, John 16, 11. One more time. John 12, 31, John 14, 30, John 16, 11. It says the God of this world with a little g is Satan. He's the ruler of the world. We know it when he tempted Jesus. He tempted Jesus as the ruler of the world. In Matthew 4. Is our advocate. Is our adversary. And listen. listen. I'm going to close with, with John 16. Where in our passage. In John 16. When he says. And concerning judgment. What? Because the ruler of this world. Watch this now. Has been Judge has been judged already. In the Greek language, that means that's a completed deal. It stands sealed. That that his fate is sealed. Matthew, write this down. Matthew 25, 41. In eternity past, when he led the revolt, he was sentenced to the lake of fire. Write this down. Revelation, the 20th chapter, verse 10. At the end of human history, that's where it goes. Boom. Revelation 20, 10. Boom, that's where it goes. Right there. Throw it in the lake of fire. Now, what's important in your life today is Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15, because that involves you. Every human being must pay attention to Revelation 20, 11 through 15. Because if you stand before the great white right throne judgment, because you never believed the gospel of Jesus Christ when it was presented to you with clarity like it has been today, and you reject that and you die physically, you're going to stand before the great white right throne judgment. And this whole deal is going to come back to be sure that you understood you had clarity of what you had to do to be saved, that the man made it very clear. And now you're going to the lake of fire. There is no excuse for this. Except you chose not to believe. It's not like any other sermon. This sermon has destiny attached to it. This, des this sermon has destiny. Your destiny is attached to this sermon today. This is serious stuff. Heavenly Father, we uh, want to thank you today for a study on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. A testimony within my own soul of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The testimony of why Christ came into the world. And why he left the world and the Holy Spirit entered. It's a phenomenal idea. But today, the sound of our voice today, Father, this is the day of salvation. Behold, behold, the day is the day. For those who know this is the day, this is the day that they must surrender. Only, only a fool would not believe that Jesus died for their sins with the buried. 
in order to receive salvation as a gift, not by works. Don't have to prove anything. The proof is in that you believe. When you believe, you are saved. Romans 1 16, the gospel, Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes it. I pray that upon the audience today, not only those who are present with us today, but those who have dropped in with us by the internet. This is serious business. This isn't just a typical Sunday service to make you feel good. This is to get you into eternity forever. To get you when, you, when you pass this way, the life is over. To be with Christ. The absence of the body to be present with the Lord. It's a gift. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. It's a gift. Receive that gift today by faith and have this deal settled. And then read Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift, not of others. We make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.